in your next couple of lectures, we're going to be talking about evolution. So today we're going to tackle the history and mechanisms of evolution. And we're talking about evolution because it's really, really important in terms of biodiversity. It's actually pretty much where all of the biodiversity on Earth comes from in the first place. So when we talk about changes in biodiversity, a lot of times we focus on why diversity would be decreasing. And we've talked about a lot of these already, and you looked at these when you read chapter 16. Um, but you also want to realize that biodiversity is increasing by a number of mechanisms as well. Um, so take a minute and make sure you kind of have these things down. And I want you to notice that really the last one on here, but the number one biggest reason why diversity would actually increase is going to be evolution. And there are three levels um, or ways that biodiversity and evolution can change things. So they can change things at a genetic level. So that would be any kind of variety in the gene pool of the species. So uh, the different types of genes that are available. So that kind of has two things under it. Genotypic diversity basically is how many different versions of the genes themselves you have, those alleles. So remember, like you have an allele for hair color, and you might have a brown hair allele and a blonde hair allele, and it's those combinations of those alleles that actually give you your traits, which are your phenotypes. So there's also phenotypic variation, which are the different versions of the traits that you have. And then if we start looking a level up from that, we can look at the variation in species. So that whole idea of species richness, how many species you have in a community, how they're structured, how they're interacting with each other. Or you can also look at biodiversity at an ecosystem level, the different ranges of habitats that you have in different areas and how those are interacting with each other. So today we're gonna focus mostly on genetic and species diversity. And you do need to know a little bit about the history of life. So remember that Earth was um, originally formed 4.7 billion years ago. Now the first billion years of Earth's lifetime, there was no life around. So we kind of talk about this in terms of chemical evolution, how the chemicals were changing to kind of pave the way for life to exist. And then life has been around for the last 3.7 billion years, so everything from that point on can be looked at in terms of biological evolution or what's happening since life has been around. Um, and there's a couple important things to notice here. So in this chemical evolution, at the beginning, of course, you had the early crust in the atmosphere, and then some organic molecules were able to start forming in the sea, and eventually we started building on those organic molecules to make bigger molecules. So there was a really important experiment um, that focused on this, and basically it was called the Miller-Urey experiment done by Stanley Miller, um, and it proved that basically we could make the potential for life in the lab. We could make all the chemicals that living things needed by basically having this mixture of gases that was available on early Earth in the atmosphere and also water and some chem basic chemicals that were already on Earth. So Stanley Miller basically put these things into a flask and he applied some electricity and he was able to create some of those early molecules like proteins and lipids that are really important for living things to survive. So that's this whole idea here. Now, when we actually got the first cells and how we actually got the cell first cells is a little bit difficult to tell. That's something that not all scientists agree on. But that had to be the next step after you had the molecules. And then from there, it branches out and you can eventually get to all of the different species that we see on Earth. So if you look at the different kingdoms of life, and these are the big kingdoms we need to know about, you see that early on what branched off were these two types of bacteria, eubacteria and archaebacteria. And bacteria are prokaryotes, so you should remember from biology that means they don't have membrane-bound organelles, they don't have a nucleus, um, and they're all some sort of bacteria, either archaea or just eubacteria, true bacteria. Um, then everything else, all the rest of these kingdoms here, they are all eukaryotes. So they have membrane-bound organelles. So that would include the animals, the plants, fungi, and also protists, which includes algae, amoebas, diatoms, all kinds of sorts of things like that. And basically how they think that we got from these prokaryotes to these eukaryotes is this idea of um, having two prokaryotes, one much bigger than the other, 
one ate the other one and when it ate it, it didn't digest it all the way because this little bacteria was able to do cellular respiration um, and that made energy for the cell. So it kept it around and that became the mitochondria of the cell. Um, they think that this happened two separate times and in plants, um, basically it ate a bacteria that was able to do photosynthesis that made food for the cell. So that's where plants got their chloroplast from. All right, so that gets us basically to this point here where we are going from single cell prokaryotes to single cell eukaryotes. And this is all happening in the oceans at this point. It's all happening underwater. So this step right here was endosymbiosis. You might want to label that on your picture there. And then eventually what happened is we start to get multicellular organisms forming where these eukaryotes are coming together in colonies probably because they're doing better as a community and that happens first in the ocean and then later they start to move on to land all right so there are some major um, steps that you need to know about here and you do need to know this geologic time scale so you have this picture and you also need to know the major extinctions that have happened throughout this time scale. So I want you to take a minute and just kind of label these first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. All right, these are the major mass extinctions. This last one is still kind of being debated, but we think we are in the middle of a sixth major mass extinction. Um, and there's a really strong amount of evidence that says that humans are actually um, causing this mass extinction, that we are decreasing the Earth's biodiversity very significantly in this time period. All right. So also make sure that you know what types of organisms went extinct in each of these mass extinctions. All right, so how do we know all this? How do we know what lived in the past, um, et cetera? We're going to go into this a little bit more detail next time, but most of it's coming from either fossil evidence, analyzing different chemicals and where they seem to have come about in different organisms, um, including the DNA, or analyzing different chemicals available in ice cores. So that's where we're getting most of our information from. And basically, it all supports this process of evolution uh, by natural selection which is basically just genetic changes in a population over time that results in new organisms. So natural selection is this idea that organisms that are best suited to an environment, or at least well suited, have certain adaptations that make them more likely to survive and produce more offspring than the organisms with the less favorable traits who will not survive or will not reproduce. And this was originally come up with in the 1800s by Charles Darwin. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, and basically, these were the observations that he had that kind of formed his theory. Um, so species were producing more offspring than the environment could support. Those resources were limited. Populations stay stable in size. So that means something must be happening to the organisms that can't be supported by this environment. And the traits of organisms vary quite a bit. So that must be coming from something that's hereditary, um, which would be the genes themselves. So there's two ways that evolution works, microevolution and macroevolution. So when we talk about microevolution, we're looking at really small genetic changes within a species. So it's not a new species yet. It's just something happening in the gene pool. And then macroevolution is more long-term changes where you get new species, which is called speciation, and you lose old species by extinctions. So we're going to look at both of these, but we're going to focus on microevolution for now. And you're going to do a lab with this next class. And there are four major processes that change the genes in a population. So the first one is mutations, and those are random changes in DNA. We'll talk about those a little more in a second. Second is natural selection, that whole idea that certain traits are going to help them survive better, so they're going to be passed on. Gene flow, which is movement of genes between different populations, like immigration kind of thing. And genetic drift, which is basically a chance change in the DNA. Uh, it's very random, but it's very important in small populations. And again, we're going to look at these things next class. And basically, all of this micro and macro evolution happens in these following steps. So uh, first step, you already have some variety present in your gene pool. So you have different types of genes. And these came about, again, by mutations. And then you 
go into overproduction, we'll talk about this in a second, competition, natural selection, and the end result of these things is adaptations and eventually, if it goes far enough, speciation. All right, so the first one, variation. This comes from a couple different things. If you remember from biology, the process of crossing over, chromosomes are swapping parts, and independent assortment, you're getting random chromosomes from each parent. Um, so that gives you a lot of variety, but you also have random mutations, which are coming from different things that can cause changes in traits as well. So whenever you change the DNA, that changes the protein it makes, so that changes the trait that you see. And if this happens in a gamete, an egg or a sperm cell, it can get passed on to the children. There's also something that goes along with this that's called reproductive potential, which is basically how many babies you can make. Um, and that will increase an organism's fitness. If they can make more babies, they can pass on this variation more times. Uh, so eventually what we get to at this point is we have too many animals, uh, the environment can't support them, they're at carrying capacity, but they all have different traits. So this is called overproduction. So overproduction leads to competition. We've talked about this already, you either have interspecific competition between different species or intraspecific competition within the same species. And then that competition leads to natural selection. So you have different selection pressures like the amount of food available or different things that are happening in the environment and that causes certain genes to basically be chosen over the other ones. Um, so the better adapted individuals are more likely to survive and when they do that they pass on their traits to the next generation. So if it's a mutation um, that caused the variety in the first place that's unfavorable, it usually gets weeded out, and the mutations that either don't have an effect or are helpful are more likely to be passed on. And if they're passed on enough and it becomes something common in the entire population, then it's called an adaptation. So an adaptation is a trait that the organism has that improves its chances of survival. And it's usually whole populations that have adaptations. And I want you to take a second and look at these. It's very important that you understand the true meaning of adaptation because a lot of people get confused between adaptation and acclimation and they are two completely separate things. All right, so that adaptation helps them to survive better in their environment. It might be something like camouflage. It might be something like a structure that they have that helps them survive. Um, but that adaptation had to come from the gene pool in the first place. So there had to be a mutation that caused them to have that trait. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there at all. And eventually, if enough of these adaptations build up and enough differences build up in a population, you could get a new species. And that's called speciation. It happens through divergent evolution. Things start to become very different or diverge. And then eventually they're so different that they can't reproduce anymore and you have a new species. So Darwin saw this with his finches. He saw that you had different beaks for different food sources on different islands. And eventually, because they were separated for a number of reasons. They were geographically isolated from each other on the islands and they became two different species that could no longer breed with each other. At that point, that's our definition of a separate species, so that's speciation. Um, and if this happens long enough in any population, you can get total new species for a variety of reasons. So again, these are our basic steps in natural selection. You have to have variation in your population and your gene pool in the first place. And then there has to be some kind of stress on the population, usually caused by too many animals and not enough resources. That will cause them to compete with each other, which will lead to natural selection. The more fit or the fit enough individuals, the ones that have the ability to survive in the environment will pass on their genes. Eventually that results in adaptations that the population all shares. And if those differences in the populations build up enough between different populations that can't reproduce with each other anymore, you will eventually get different species. All right, so we'll look at these steps a little bit more next class and we'll also go through those different um, mechanisms of microevolution and model these and hopefully you should have a good understanding of how natural selection works by the end of the day tomorrow. Thanks and see you tomorrow.